actually uh, we may start good evening dear friends we are pleased to welcome you to the next webinar of the admission campaign to european humanities university as a part of our today's meeting speaker and gave us issue lecture and uh, social anthropologist will tell us a little bit more about the topic of feminist ethnography in non-free society the belarusian case of critical love studies and uh, first of all, I want to remind you that you can ask all your questions in the chat or voice them after the end of the lecture. So, Andre, the floor is yours. Hey, so um, good evening. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, good. Um, my name is Andrei Vaziano. I'm social anthropologist by training, and I'm teaching a gender studies program at European Humanities University. Um, and I'm not going to talk uh, a lot today, actually. That would be uh, lovely if we would have a Q&A session with your uh, questions. Um, but if no, at least, um, um, at least um, I'll try to um, present one of perspectives on how we work a gender studies program. Um, and I uh, will mostly talk uh, about research done by others, but I will also um, touch upon the work that I'm doing by myself um, a bit. Um, I'm going to talk in English, but uh, you can ask your questions in Belarusian, Ukrainian, Russian, Lithuanian um, as well. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the seminar is recorded. Yeah, so um, that's why we do not require to uh, show your names, but surely uh, you can introduce yourself. Um, okay. So I just have a few uh, slides for you from PowerPoint. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen now. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so before we start, I actually don't know uh, the background of uh, those who will listen to this presentation, and I don't know whether you are coming from social sciences, or probably uh, you uh, did some uh, feminist or gender or uh, sexuality related research before. Um, so uh, please don't hesitate to ask about the meaning of terms if you see that any of those terms are uh, unfamiliar to you. Um, yeah, actually there are already uh, quite a few terms uh, in, um, in uh, the title of this presentation and there's a feminist ethnography, critical of studies, Actually, non-free society also sometimes uh, needs clarification. So as I'll be presenting, I'll touch upon uh, all of those a bit. Uh, but uh, first of all, probably let's discuss what is love studies as a multidisciplinary study area. Um, again, I don't know how many of you have heard about that. Um, and uh, we uh, usually put love into a box of uh, those non-discussable and intuitively uh, clear labels, which it is not. Um, and as anthropologists by training, at least I can argue about uh, differences between uh, languages uh, in uh, what regards designation of love and love-like related feelings, uh, practices, ideas, concepts, and so on. And um, today, uh, love stands out as a multidisciplinary study area. That means it is studied by uh, specialists coming from literature research, coming from history research, coming from anthropology, sociology, um, and um, other um, psychology and uh, other research areas. 
and it also studied by different methods. So for instance, uh, cognitive psychologists uh, would probably be interested in some uh, mechanisms that uh, provoke people uh, feeling like they are in love. Yeah, or probably some um, uh, medical scholars would be interested in the level of oxytocin uh, in, in our uh, body. Yeah, that is usually associated with love. But then, uh, of course, uh, there is uh, more of a constructionist approach to love that says this is not some universal phenomena. It has different specifics in different local cultures. Uh, and uh, here we go with looking into love as a poetic trope, for instance. So literature scholars look into how love and romance was described in different verses, novels, uh, poems, uh, myths, and so on. Um, then, uh, of course, we look at love as a gendered social phenomenon, which means that there are more and uh, less acknowledged forms of uh, love and that uh, there are expected or there are social expectations related to people of different genders who are in love, yeah, or in some state that we describe as being in love. Uh, and for instance, in uh, gender studies or from gender scholars, we know that um, kind of relationship work and relationship work is something done to maintain, to support, to prolong relations. Uh, to make them durable and pleasant and uh, vital and, um, and healthy and whatever else. Uh, so uh, this load of relationship work uh, is quite often put uh, on uh, women if we talk about heterosexual relationships. Um, that also we can think about uh, love as a particular model of social relations that society expect or does not expect from people. And uh, of course, particular manifestations uh, or performances or images of love can be oppressed. If we think about homosexual love or love between people of one gender or same sex love, uh, then um, uh, we clearly understand that in some uh, societies, uh, images of this love is not something that you can see in IKEA catalog, for instance, yeah, or in advertisement, in any kind of advertisement, in a school book, um, and uh, in um, uh, any kind of official document, and so on. Yeah, and then in some other societies, uh, this form of love would be okay for, uh, for the majority. Yeah, so there could be oppressed models of social relations which are understood as love, but then there could be also imposed uh, models of uh, social relations uh, or imposed forms of love. Uh, and for instance, if we think about uh, the amount of people who are expected to participate in relationship, then polyamoric relationships, which mean there are more than two, uh, in, um, in that uh, you know, form of uh, social connection, um, polyamoric relations are also not accepted by default in every uh, population, in every society. And then, of course, uh, we do not operate only on the level of society, because in every society there are communities. Yeah? So societies are heterogeneous, they're different, their different parts are in conflict with each other. Uh, and that means that sometimes we can look into those subcultural meanings of love, uh, something that is uh, relevant and understandable for a particular group of people. And sometimes they have to, uh, uh, quite often they are aware that the larger society does not perceive their form of love or their practice of love uh, as, um, um, as a desirable one. Um, 
And also this uh, list can be prolonged and you see here that love, for instance, can be seen as a subject for commodification if we think about goods and services that are proposed for people who are counted as those in love. If you think about St. Valentine's Day, then that is a commodification of feeling. Uh, or also a Marxist theory actually would push us towards idea of emotional communities and class nature of feeling. So they would say that some classes of people, social classes of people, uh, depending on their level of income or specifics of education or way of life, uh, can more afford themselves to be in love than some others. Yeah. So there are different perspectives on that. Um, and um, critical love studies, um, they add another dimension to this situation. They also um, critically question what is love. Yeah. So they do not take the category of love for granted. They are not only aware that in different societies there are different practices and discourses and materialities of love. They also uh, try to interrogate and to ask, okay, what do we count as love? Uh, if in different languages there are different sets of words corresponding to, to love, uh, um, do we... Um, can we do without looking at love in dynamics? Yeah. And that's why, for instance, critical uh, love scholars, they would look at narratives of love and uh, they would look at how people construct the stories of love uh, and how they construct the discourses. Right? So um, again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the notion of discourse, uh, but... Um, Mikhail Gratzke, for instance, would argue that uh, love has a discursive nature and that love is what people say it is. Yeah? So uh, this scholar looks at this phenomena of love or romantic relationship uh, as a kind of uh, discourse. Uh, and the discourse is formed with performative utterances. So with particular words, that basically changed the situation. And that um, uh, idea of performative uh, utterances comes from linguists, uh, from uh, CERN, for instance, and uh, in linguistics uh, and in early discourse studies, they would say there are different groups of uh, performative utterances marked by particular words. For instance, uh, I... Um, um, uh, like I agree to be your uh, wife or I agree to be your husband means a performative utterance because these are words they have that have lots of consequences. Now, so uh, for a narrative approach or it can also be called deconstructionist approach, these words are very important, uh, but not per se. Yeah, they are important because they change the way that people maintain their relationships and they also change mutual expectations and they change uh, our understanding of what people owe to each other, what are their obligations or what are their rights and so on. Um, however, there is also another um, another um, approach or another perspective um, in critical love studies, which is materialist feminist approach. And uh, according to this approach, it's not only discourse and not only words that we uh, should analyze. Um, if we look back at the uh, idea of gender as something that is performed, and this is idea by Judith Butler, then we would see that gender um, cannot come into being only with words. Yeah? It also comes into being with different practices. And uh, none of them in isolation produce gender. They only produce gender uh, together. 
And uh, Gratzke proposes to talk about love dispositive um, according to the same model. Yeah, so we see that the love dispositive, which means love norms and love institutions, love theory, and all speech acts and practices generated by and in the name of love, as well as material conditions such as gender division of reproductive labor um, and yeah, those uh, hormone levels in people um, together produce and reproduce everything that is experienced or represented as love. Yeah, so for critical love studies, it is important to look both at discourses and actions. Yeah? What is said and what is done in order to understand what acts as love in particular circumstances. Um, and um, yeah, um, there are uh, different concepts uh, now that try to unite these two perspectives. One is love acts that I mentioned, um, and um, uh, another is love dispositive. So we're not going now into those concepts, but just to uh, to mention, yeah, that there is now uh, that um, um, the, the the trend towards understanding love critically is something more than words, yeah, but um, also. Of course, it, not, it cannot be reduced to materiality only. Um, and now we're coming closer to the uh, context, uh, which is uh, relevant for Belarusian situation, but not only, yeah, unfortunately. And this is context of non-free societies. Yeah, so um, we are talking today about Belarus as non-free society for different reasons. Uh, and I think for most of you present here, uh, it goes without explanation. Yeah, so there are political freedoms repressed, there are different forms of uh, physical and symbolical violence performed uh, upon population. Uh, there is forced relocation of many people, refugee-like uh, circumstances. Um, and uh, this notion I got to know from my colleague, Jana Senko. Uh, and um, we can argue, uh, and we also see from many different international rankings that Belarus cannot be regarded as free society. Yeah, so there are different kinds of uh, limitations on rights, freedoms, uh, ways of life, uh, and um, yeah, they are experienced on everyday basis. Why it is important to study how people love, what is their practice of love and discourse of love during mass repressions? Um, well, uh, just a few answers to that question, and this is not uh, an exhaustive list, so by no means. Um, one thing that comes to uh, our mind uh, is uh, that love is an aspect of political behavior. Yeah, that is enclosed in the private sphere. That means that uh, political choices and political preferences uh, of people, they're not disconnected from uh, whom they love and uh, on what basis and how they experience that love. Um, and uh, we know now from uh, research into, um, into uh, transformations of sexuality of Belarusians uh, since the start of mass repressions in 2020, um, that for some people that interest in uh, the ongoing events became an, um, an obligatory condition of the possibility for being together. Now that means people would just reject, some, some Belarusians reject uh, the relations with those who uh, who do not share their interest in ongoing events in Belarus or who stands on the opposite side of political divide. Um, then also uh, talking about uh, love during mass repressions, we think about mobility and uh, forced exodus from the country, uh, change uh, of um, place of residence. Yeah, so this is a factor that affects mobility, 
uh, and residents related life choices. People do not take all decisions about where to live and how to live and uh, at which point to evacuate from the country, just to move from the country um, alone. Yeah, they took these uh, decisions um, with the help of others most often. And uh, among those others, uh, those loved or those beloved uh, have the, uh, the main voice, yeah, so to say. Um, then uh, another perspective here. Uh, when uh, people talk about uh, love and when Belarusians talk about love with uh, people from other countries, especially from democratic and free societies, Sometimes uh, they um, find themselves in a situation where their interlocutor does not understand how particularly love is performed uh, in Belarusian context. And um, also, uh, when we look at Western studies of love, we quite often um, can see that uh, those studies are focused on how people pay attention and how they maintain uh, the romantic character of uh, connection with other people. Uh, but this is usually not the situation of forced exodus or of hiding from police or of going to protest or not going to pro protest. Um, this is also usually not a situation when your partner is imprisoned and you have to somehow organize uh, uh, your everyday life, but also care about their parents or their pets uh, or just their property. Um, this is not the situation uh, when uh, you and your beloved is divided by, um, by borders and visa restrictions um, and uh, some police restrictions sometimes as well. So there is a range of situations uh, that uh, people from non-free societies have to explain about love to those from free societies. Um, this is not to argue that there is some uh, binary dichotomic divide between free and non-free. Of course, there are different kinds of uh, continuums and ranges and spectrum. Uh, and there are rankings, so we can say that some societies are less free than others. Yeah, and that means that also that practice of love uh, is um, varying from country to country. And of course, it is also transforming uh, within one country. Yeah, so probably uh, to be in love, practice love, uh, make love, and so on in Belarus before 2020 was something different than it is today. Um, and uh, Valeria Boravets, who is a student of uh, HU, who has just recently uh, defended her thesis, uh, looked into um, mass repressions and uh, the presence of state violence as into factor uh, transforming sexuality. So she explored how sexual practices and corporeality and sexuality of people is transformed uh, during the uh, 2020s. And um, this is also another angle of view. Now, finally, just to mention it shortly, um, uh, looking into love during mass repressions and all the transaction costs that it brings together can also reframe the meaning of not having a significant other. Um, so just what it means to be single during mass repressions. Yeah, there are many um, questions coming with that. So that is the context that we are dealing with. Uh, and uh, the next question is how to study that. Yeah? And uh, here as a person who is teaching a course in methodology, I will say a few things about ethnographic approach. So um, as you probably uh, realize, gender studies are uh, into qualitative methods a lot. So this is not only about counting inequality or counting exclusion and discrimination. 
although figures are very important here. Yeah, but this is also about understanding the causal relations, the reasons, the consequences, the imagined um, uh, causal relations. Uh, and um, here, ethnographic approach is one of a few approaches. And there is also discourse analysis, and then there is narratology, and then there is conversation analysis. Uh, of course, there is a visual analysis as well, um, and they all coexist in gender studies. I'm going to uh, focus a bit on ethnographic approach. And by ethnography, uh, this is a very short and broad definition. Yeah, but by ethnography, uh, I mean uh, an observation, co-presence, and co-participation based research approach. Now that means we collect our research data by observing others, but also by, by being together with them in different forms. Online co-presence is also possible. Yeah, and also quite often doing things that they do, participating in things that they are going through and that they participate in. Um, and uh, feminist scholars made an important contribution into uh, rethinking of ethnographic approach. So first of all, they were um, among the first to reflect on colonial and military guilt of anthropology. Because we know that 120 years ago, ethnographers actually were missionaries, and uh, their goal was not to produce uh, knowledge in order to understand other peoples and nations, but produce that knowledge in order to convert them into Christianity, to control them by different means, to take their land in a more effective way, to use them, to exploit them, and so on. Uh, and same goals, unfortunately, for uh, the uh, world wars, the first and the second one. For instance, in USA, most of anthropologists collaborated to some extent with, um, with military in order to understand Japanese culture better, because Japan was the main enemy at, uh, at that moment. Um, then um, feminist scholars reflected on gendered nature of academy and knowledge production, because there is a lack of recognition for contributions made by female scholars. Uh, and we know that there is a, a disbalance in academy as well. Uh, quite often, uh, women would do a more boring uh, academic work that is considered less important, but actually without that work, the output would not be possible as well. Um, and uh, then also uh, the feminist uh, ethnography is concerned with privileges and inequalities that can also emerge between different kinds of women. Yeah, so they do not take a woman as a universal category, rather uh, it is also relational one, and what it means to be a woman is different for different cultures, but it also means that particular inequalities present in the world, uh, for instance, inequality between colonizer and colonized, between white and uh, non-white people of color, they're also present uh, in relations between uh, women or between queer people. So we can also uh, transpose yeah, that, uh, that observation onto queer people. Um, and uh, these are few layers of self-reflection that are important for uh, ethnographic research. Uh, so a uh, feminist ethnographer all the time questions her position uh, and positionality and privileges that we as researchers have, and we usually have them uh, in relation to those who don't have academician status or researcher status or scholar status, and so on. Um, um, another thing to mention here is that uh, ethnographic approach uh, in feminism resulted into development of participatory formats of research. For instance, militant research or participant research in action, which means uh, that 
the studied community uh, becomes not just uh, object of uh, scrutinizing, yeah, but also the community that we want to study, we as scholars, uh, is involved from the earliest possible stage into design of research, conduction of research, and uh, presentation of the research. That means sometimes we um, invite people to pose questions with us, the questions about community that they come from. Uh, and then we use different forms of uh, validation uh, in order to, um, to make sure that they agree with what we have written about them. Now, finally, uh, feminist research uh, produced many non-conventional forms of research presentation. Uh, that means um, we now in gender studies uh, and in social science in general do not just produce academic articles, uh, but this goes uh, beyond the format of academic writing. Now it is also about uh, writing in uh, fiction-like uh, forms, uh, writing verses, poetry, making performances, uh, staging uh, theater uh, plays, and uh, ethnographic playwriting, uh, producing exhibitions, and so on. Uh, and um, these forms of research presentation are not just guided by ideas of how to be fancier and more original, but this is also a question of addressing to a uh, largest possible audience, uh, of giving the voice to those who haven't been heard before, and uh, of social impact as well, yeah? because uh, feminist research is concerned with impact and with social responsibility of researcher. Um, one of the uh, topics related to this reflection is ethnographic standards or standards of uh, academic work that are also different in different countries. And uh, we know how standards of Western Academy are expected to be fulfilled also when we make research in other, uh, in other contexts. And um, if we try to research anything about uh, non-free society, then um, this becomes a serious obstacle. If we take an extreme case of totalitarian societies, such as North Korea, Turkmenistan, uh, or even China sometimes, or Eritrea, then the research is mostly focusing on those who could escape the territory of those countries, or on diaspora. Yeah, so on North Koreans who live abroad, uh, many people or Eritreans who live abroad and so on. Sometimes we can research their relations with their family, their communication with, uh, with their parents and children who remained there. Yeah, but this is really about uh, going there by ourselves. And um, in many, uh, re in many institutions in the West, for instance, require that each interview uh, would be taken after written consent. Like a person has to sign particular letter saying, oh, I'm aware that I will be, will be interviewed for this and this project by this and this researcher, which is not very practical and not really safe and also not realistic to fulfill in many contexts, including Belarusian one. Yeah, so uh, if we want to talk to some people who are in Belarus now, um, to ask them to sign something, to write something is not the best thing that we can do to them. Yeah, and then probably it is less important what an institution requires for us if it if it puts our uh, research community or member of research, uh, research social group into risk. Then another challenge is that uh, the reliable statistics are not existing for non-free societies. Um, uh, we cannot really ask people to uh, practice many forms of uh, visual ethnography that would be 
possible in other contexts. We cannot uh, ask them to film yeah, a lot. Um, and also, if we think about general interest towards that topic, then political science uh, dominates over anthropological uh, interest here. Yeah, so uh, in representations of country quite often, we would uh, hear politicians, political activists, opposition, resistance movement, and so on. Uh, but uh, the everyday perspective uh, remains um, under investigated most often. Yeah. So um, this is also a challenge because uh, speaking in, uh, about spheres that are visible only on everyday basis. Sex and love is not something most interested for outer observers about Belarus now. Yeah, but this might be very important within the country and within the society because it is still a part of a social fabric that uh, keeps the life going. Um, there is a notion of ethnographic eclipse that originally was um, it originally was uh, uh, introduced by anthropologists who worked with prisons. Yeah, so that was about impossibility to go to prison uh, and to obtain ethnographic accounts from there. Uh, and there is even a debate in ethnography about, uh, about who can tell about prison more, those who uh, are still there or those who have been incarcerated but then got released. Um, and uh, in contexts uh, like uh, Belarus or Afghanistan or Myanmar or Saudi Arabia, there are those metaphors of prison-like societies, yeah? like uh, many outer observers, but also people from there would compare the, their country with prison. So that's why we can use this metaphor of ethnographic eclipse. Yeah? And then the, the, the question arises how still we can study something in those societies. Yeah. And uh, here, the concluding part of my uh, talk is uh, about how actually love relationships or romantic and uh, gender and sexuality related topics are studied in Belarusian context. Um, I'm referring here to research done by Valeria that I have mentioned, but also by uh, some other colleagues of mine. And also um, I'm doing now an ethnographic study of uh, romantic relationships uh, during mass repressions. Uh, and uh, I have not included a slide about mass repressions in Belarus. There are many figures and I have them and I think you it is easier to find them. Yeah, we can demonstrate that really in Belarus something is going on that is not comparable to any countries at borders with Belarus, for instance. Yeah, um, and um, here there are more traditional ways uh, to obtain some data. Uh, and these are, for instance, uh, interviews with people who are now in relationship or formerly in relationship and now single. Yeah, where at least one party was uh, affected by repressions, uh, more or less directly. Now, it is also difficult to define what means being affected by repressions, by mass repressions, is just the fact of risk or high statistical risk to be detained already uh, means being affected by repressions. Yeah, but um, uh, as a priority in my research, I deal with cases where people went through administrative detention, for instance, through forced, uh, forced exodus from the country, sometimes not one time, just more than one time. Um, there is a kind of, uh, um, kind of uh, know-how uh, about interviewing people from international couples because just as other people, Belarusians are not only in love with other Belarusians, yeah, they also find themselves in different uh, kinds of international or transnational uh, relations. Uh, and sometimes it's a fact, it affects a lot where they are, at which point do they leave, uh, how do they feel about uh, their participation or non-participation in uh, 
uh, into the recent events and so on. Uh, but interviews also have a, a weak point here because if we want to understand how something is unfolding and how something is um, um, but like how meaning of love is uh, transforming uh, in connection to the circumstances, the interview is bad because interview is something that encloses and finalizes a narrative. Now that means as we took an interview, the story has ended quasi. Now, of course, we can also circumvent and somehow minimize this weakness uh, by a series of interviews, by uh, getting back to those who we have interviewed, and so on. Uh, but uh, quite often, and this we know from texts uh, by critical love scholars, quite often the story of uh, love only gets completed through a narrative. So until people tell about that, to someone, the story doesn't feel complete and is not performed as complete. And um, in uh, the situations or in my field, for instance, I mostly dealt with uh, the couples who are not uh, sure about the future and not because of their feelings, yeah, but uh, because of uh, the bureaucratic troubles, because of military situation, uh, because of uh, employment or unemployment, and so on. Yeah, so these are stories in progress. Uh, that's why observation, uh, including observation on social media, sometimes uh, comes to be more effective. Talking about observation uh, on social media, um, um, I think uh, here we can really talk about public stories and less public stories. Yeah, because some stories we can really observe uh, on the media. And uh, this is uh, less ethically obliging for us. Yeah, because uh, in a way, the responsibility for safety is partly delegated to, to those people themselves, but only partly. And one should not be uh, uh, just formal here, because uh, Belarusian media landscape, for instance, is multi-layered, and uh, just the fact that something is online and formally can lead to repression um, doesn't always mean that it's easily findable. Now, in some other cases, it's actually uh, a task of researcher to find it online. But once you find it and publish some link that was in the dark corner of a forgotten website, then you just draw it to the surface. And that means another risks. Um, so uh, less public stories um, are more controllable for us in this context. And I um, mentioned this written conversations in longitude. Uh, is uh, one of the ways to go here because there the uh, confidentiality of talk is presumed. We just know now about digital safety and digital hygiene. Um, and um, then there is now that gray zone between, okay, it is published on the web, so why cannot I quote it in my research? Uh, and like it was only told to me in uh, in a secret chat, yeah, or in a closed chat for many people. So um, here are just some some insights. Um, and um, yeah, uh, many uh, ethnographic tools that could be useful in other consequences, unfortunately, are not safe in Belarusian context. And here, just to mention case of dating apps, which are used for recruitment for study participants in gender studies and queer studies. Uh, and uh, this uh, digital space is actually remained relatively free. And uh, there was a lot of dissent and dissidents there till 2021. Um, so even when 
uh, mass repressions had already started uh, in Belarus on uh, Tinder and Grindr and Hornet. Uh, so I'm mentioning not only uh, hetero apps, but also uh, apps for gay people. Uh, it was very easy to find uh, white, red, white symbolics, for instance. So people somehow considered that space as a more private, intimate, and safe space. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we know then that uh, a map from riot police worker reported on a young woman whom he met via Tinder, and she was arrested. And it happened in Belarus last year. Uh, that means um, this tool, for instance, does not work. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go through all those uh, uh, stories that you have here. Uh, and also I'm publishing them with a delay. So like, this is, for instance, the uh, status quo for the, uh, for the um, late 2022. And some stories have uh, went on and have developed. And here, one of the most uh, published and visible stories was uh, the case of Roman Fredosevich and Sofia Sofiega. Um, and of course, now it um, has developed into a completely different direction. Yeah? But this was a case to observe. And actually, it still is a case to observe. Um, and uh, there are many uh, more other cases which are non-public and it's difficult to work with them because you have to anonymize a lot. And I'm changing not only names, but I'm changing also um, names of cities, for instance. Because if it is a story about a Belarusian uh, uh, and the Ukrainian who reside in uh, Ukraine now, yeah, and some of them, quite likely would have troubles with documents. That is a question whether we could uh, talk about a particular um, town or city, because there are not so many of Belarusians in Ukraine, although there are quite a few. Yeah? And uh, as I started to work with this field, I just faced with, uh, um, with another figures rather than I imagined. Um, and um, yeah, uh, here um, like the um, the last thing I would mention here is that uh, quite often we have to um, to talk about research as a privilege um, and uh, as a way to deal with a situation that we not always can afford to ourselves. That's also something not very familiar for Western Academy. And uh, there is a lot of things to say yeah, uh, from our perspective. Uh, sometimes we can, or usually researcher can withdraw uh, themselves from life realms of repressed people and their significant others. But uh, none of the latter can withdraw from uh, the liability of Belarusian citizenship equally easy. And in this situation, I think the uh, native positionality of Belarusian research and Belarusian field uh, is, um, is a good position as well, yeah, because it provides some background understanding, a mutual understanding, probably provides more trust. Uh, and also uh, increases the possibility of speaking outwards yeah, from um, uh, giving voices to Belarusians and not just to researchers. Yeah, so this, I think, quite, uh, quite important. Um, and uh, I think this is a very important thing to do, not to pretend that Belarus is already a full-fledgedly totalitarian society, because there is still internet connection to Belarus. There are people who uh, move here and there. And uh, the very ethnographic effort actually could be a sign that someone is still interested to listen to people. Yeah? Uh, and uh, it is important also to uh, make the translation work of explaining the things that are common sense for us 
inside our society uh, to people who know few or nothing about this society. And this, I think, is relevant not only for Belarusian case. I'm just uh, talking about the case that I'm working with right now. And just to mention in my career, like I'm not from Belarus and uh, in my career, most of the research that I done was related to other countries that is Ukraine and Romania. Um, but uh, even their uh, researchers face with that uh, misunderstanding between researchers even. Yeah. So uh, critical love studies is not an exception here. Mm. The practice of love and discourse of love and acts of love, they are different in different situations. And um, um, it is um, interesting and yeah, promising uh, challenge for gender scholars to make that translation work. Um, yes, I think that's it from me and I'll be happy to answer questions if there are any. And for those who joined later, you can ask your questions in Belarusian, Ukrainian, Russian, Lithuanian, I will answer. I know that our um, applicants are usually very shy during the seminars. Uh, don't be shy. But I also see a couple of colleagues. So probably someone would want to comment or ask, I don't know, for us to use the remaining six minutes. Mm, hey everyone, I don't know if I, if I have a right to ask because I think I missed almost everything <laughs> as I just uh, played in Vilnius. But uh, if you did not speak of that, uh, I, I wanted to ask how did you, how did you, what was the aim of your own, you know, research and how did you reach the field there? And if you did ask, uh, talk about it. Then I'm sorry. <laughs> I actually, uh, yeah, thank you, Valeria. Um, the aim of research is to understand how um, love uh, and uh, romance are now understood differently among Belarusians during the mass repressions. How mass repressions actually uh, affect the way that Belarusian people view, perform perceive um, love and romance. Yeah, and uh, just to share maybe very preliminary insights, the discourse of responsibility and care is very much dominant. And like uh, love for many Belarusians that I'm talking to and I'm listening to is not about uh, romantic uh, affects, emotions and so on, but about taking care, being together, uh, planning together, uh, caring for themselves together, and so on. So uh, I think there's also the kind of uh, um, uh, yeah, some parallels with the research that you did. Yeah? And I think uh, uh, one parallel exactly is about like, dealing with someone who is interested in what's going on becomes a condition for many people. Um, in uh, my field, I'm observing couples who mostly got into relationships before the 2020. Yeah, so I'm looking at how the situation affects them and their trajectories are very different. So I'm still lost about how to systematize this, um, yeah, this uh, rhizome of connections uh, also, they find themselves in different countries, some of them in Belarus, some are not, and so on. Some of them are queer, some of them are hetero, and that also makes difference uh, increasingly. Uh, so, um, yeah, sorry, 
talk too, too much. How I got there, uh, just one thing I can mention, uh, it's not a secret. Um, I uh, have uh, um, Belarusian citizenship, but I also have Ukrainian uh, residence permit. So I traveled three times after the start of full-scale war to Ukraine as a volunteer, but I also met people there. So that was my uh, insight into that part of my field, but it is by no means reduced to Belarusians in Ukraine. Actually, I would not say this is a large part of them. Just I think this is a prominent segment, like prominent part within that multiplicity, people who should be um, um, talked about, yeah, but there are many more others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? I don't know, maybe uh, Valeria would share her thoughts as well about, uh, about researching sexuality uh, during mass repressions. Is, it, uh, is there something fundamentally different uh, from the perspective that I was talking about? Uh, well, yeah, first of all, the kind of get into my mind that uh, in my research, although it was quite limited uh, number of respondents, informants, uh, the trajectories were different too. So I don't, uh, please share how you deal with that because uh, those are all very personal experiences and they differ in uh, and that depends uh, in, in my case that depended too on the sexuality and um, sexual identity and so on and so on but uh, uh, and the difference was that I focused on you know I did not and maybe that that was an omission I don't know I did not talk to couples I talked to just one by one persons and their personal experiences how how uh, so maybe it, it would be interesting to trace how how couples deal with their you know because because that's two side road and I just um, I was talking to people about how what they felt and how those events reflected on their perceiving of of their sexual life um yeah and that was very different responses as well but all um somehow affected but but by by uh, the things seen and tra traumatic to um to you know to personal experiences i don't know what to say i'm sorry <laughs> and no but it's very interesting actually and i think this is uh, a good illustration of how our uh questions differ a bit because I think uh, sex is a more intimate, discursively more intimate thing. So probably it makes more things, uh, it makes more sense to interview people on their own and not the couples. And I was also not interviewing couples, but just in some cases I communicated with both people in couple. Um, and um, um in all cases they just knew about my research status and that this is something uh i mean in cases like protasevich sapega of course they don't know about my existence but this is just uh, a study of media materials yeah but then people with whom i have personal contact i usually just like i reveal my researched identity yeah you cannot spy as ethnographer so yeah but this is interesting already because uh, it, it, it it shows uh, that our topics are from same domain, but still they focus on slightly different aspects of reality. I hope we did not present it as a very scary thing to our students or future students. Yeah, because uh, actually research is also a lot of fun. I know it's strange, it sounds strange after the hour of uh, uh, our present, my presentation and our talk, but there are many uh, warm and cheerful moments in the field as well, in the field work, and people are usually grateful. 
for for the fact that you are interested in them and listen to them. Um, so yeah, there are many uh, lighter sides to that as well. And as we had one hour of time, we can conclude on that optimistic note, actually. But if there are any questions, uh, feel free to contact us. My email is indicated on uh, the uh, website of European Humanities University. Um, and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions regarding our program and, and so on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Volga, and thank you all. And uh, I'm saying bye-bye now, and hopefully see you soon in other occasions. Thank you. Thank Dominic. you. Thank you very much, Andre, for such detailed and satisfying lecture. Thank you for providing the Belarusian cases, if not only Belarusian cases. So yeah, uh, thank you, everyone who was with us today. And have a nice day. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth.